All right, let's move on. Now that I piqued your interest, let's move on to regulation, government regulation of financial institutions. Okay, we've got a lot to cover. We're going to try to kind of catch up. I will tell you that starting in chapter, I think it's chapter five, um, we'll be doing, the videos are already made, and so we'll be able to catch up. Okay, so we'll, we'll get back on schedule. All right, so. So this chapter has to do with the regulatory environment. The government's, oh, how did that happen? Around the world, all right, have created for financial service firms. So financial service firms are highly regulated, okay? Why are they highly regulated? Why does government pay so much attention to uh, these firms? First, because depository institutions and non-depository institutions like mutual funds, investments, pension funds, they hold the savings of the public. They're safeguarding the public's money. Man, other than love and life, the third most important thing is money. For some people, it's the most important thing. Okay? So you gotta make sure you do the best job you can. Okay. That's another thing that gets me. Anytime you, a politician says we have to ensure this will never happen again, don't that think about how ridiculous that is. They say it all the time. We must make sure this never happens. Really, are you God? How will you make sure it never happens again? Okay. You can't. You can learn from the past. You can take steps to minimize but you can't make sure something doesn't happen again. Yeah. Okay. And you can only kill somebody once. Okay. So I guess you can say, I'll make sure that he's dead and I'll make sure that we don't kill him again. But other than that. All right. So two, bring stability to the financial system. If you want a healthy economy, you've got to have a stable financial system. It's critical. Okay. And when you look around the world at all of the economic problems, that exists. I talk to the Walton students all the time. It's heartbreaking what is going on in their countries. It's all corrupt. And there's nothing stable. And so when Joe Biden says we're going to open the border and give government benefits, what happens? Well, thousands of people start walking. <laughs> you know, they want to come here because they want stability. They're not greedy people. They're not bad people. They're just like you and me. They want stability. Okay? And then to prevent abuse of financial services customers. And that happens all the time. Man, human nature. Whoa. You don't believe in Satan? Just look at how people treat each other. Oof. All right. They even get on Facebook and say stuff personally. All right. Financial institutions are subject to some of the heaviest, most comprehensive rules applied to any industry. Okay? All right, what is the downside regulation? There's an upside in regulation, all these things. This is what the government's trying to do, positive things. Let's not look at the regulators as, as our adversaries. They can be sometimes, but they're needed. Okay? So they can be burdensome to employees and to customers. It, regulations can make it difficult to do business. Regulations cost a lot of money. Firms have to employ a lot of people to keep them in line with the regulations. And then, again, as in point number one, burdensome, it can really hold down innovation and efficiency because it raises the cost. And so a lot of things might not be tried because you, the cost is so high, you won't make a return on it. So anything that's, that slows down innovation and efficiency is potentially damaging to our quality of life. So it's a balance between regulating and not regulating. And as I tell our management class, every time we've had a financial crisis, it has been caused in part by bad government policy. Sometimes it's intentional, where the people really want to do some bad things, okay? Like, say, AOC. But sometimes people have really good intentions, but what they, the ideas that they, that they try to work out. All right. So, again, why are uh, banks closely regulated? 
it has some savings, okay? Uh, banks have the power to create money. That's right, they create money by making loans available and by making investments. Banks are sources of credit and money. So banks have a critical role in facilitating and enabling commerce. Really important to have a good bank. Okay. You know, there's a, a saying, banks only loan money to people who don't need it. If, if I were a banker and someone said that to me, I would be devastated. Because that is not the role of banking. Banking, it, banks have to take some risk. It's their job to take some risk with the loans that they make. All right. So right from the get-go, banks have been involved with government at all levels. Okay. So unfortunately, when you think government, you also think money. They go hand in hand. Government and money. All right. So in the U.S., banks are regulated through a dual banking system. Really, it's, it's like a quadruple banking system, as you see in all right? Federal and state authorities have regulatory powers. Banking is a complicated business in terms of regulations because there are so many people that are watching, so many different groups, all right? And there are multiple agencies at the federal and at the state level that are watching you. It's like it's, it's a never-ending series of examinations. Different groups coming in and checking up on you. Oops. Okay. Everybody caught up with me? If, if, you, if I ever get ahead of you too far ahead, just raise your hand or say, hey, Dr. E, slow down. Or whatever. All right. All right. Now, interestingly, and this is not a new idea, some firms actually seek out regulation. Some companies want regulation. Why? Well, because they're already in business. Once they're in business, then they want to make it tougher for other companies to compete with them. And I tell you what, that's totalitarianism, and it's terrible, it's pure greed, and we need to be on the lookout for it. How many of you guys have read The Road to Surf? Read the Road to Serfdom? It's an important book, The Road to Serfdom. If you didn't know better, you would have thought that somebody wrote it in the last month or two. It was written in like 1940, 41, something like that. And it's talk, it talks about how the U.S. is creeping toward totalitarianism and how reminiscent it is of what happened to Germany after World War I. And one thing that this economist, Frederick Hayek, it talks about is the need to promote competition. Socialists want collectivism. The state, the state, the state. Capitalists, people who, who value freedom and liberty, they want competition. You can't have both. It's one or the other. The idea of having both doesn't work. So, some companies in a capitalist economy still try this. Who's seen The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio? You haven't seen that? Was it, David, did you like it? Yeah. Oh, man, Leonardo, is, is he not a good actor? I mean, that dude, he's awesome. I ain't talking about the Wolf of Wall Street. Get off of that. <laughs> that was terrible. I watched five minutes of it and turned it off. No. But in The Aviator, Alec Baldwin, who used to do Donald Trump on Saturday Night Live until he's had all kinds of problems of his own, um, was the president of Pan Am. And he was able to convince Congress to limit the number of airlines that could fly internationally in the United, from the United States out to one. And said it was good for consumers. Whereas Leonardo DiCaprio, who was Howard Hughes, wanted to, he had a, he had a rival airline and he wanted it to fly internationally. He wanted to compete with Pan Am. And eventually, they opened it up, they deregulated it. But there was Pan Am in the U.S., and they were 
parading around saying it's good for the U.S. consumer. That's a false prophet. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that. All right. Regulations often block entry into the regulated industry. All right. And uh, a well-known regulated industry that we have, uh, Jack's uncle. Is he your uncle? Mm -hmm. Johnny's family owned a liquor store in Charleston. If you get a liquor store permit, and I say, Jack doesn't go to that liquor store. Don't be looking at him like that. <laughs> but you have to get a permit. And y'all remember a couple of years ago when Cersei finally um, started uh, allowing for, um, the restaurants. And oh, Harding jumped in and all the churches got all bunched up and said, you can't do that. What we want is for people to drive to Cabot and drink and then get on the road and drive back to Cersei. That's what we really want. And so that's, you know, okay. So, um, but the point is that when the government can limit who's doing business, it's an oligopoly or a monopoly. And that's what you have. Man, those permits are worth something. All right. So regulations can increase uh, customer confidence. They make people feel uh, more comfortable that um, everything is on the up and up, everything is safe. And in a democracy and in capitalism, and we go over this in, in um, Manfin, I asked the students, is the U.S. economy a house of bricks or a house of straw? You remember that, um, uh, you remember that cartoon or whatever, like that comic or that fairy tale? And everybody says, oh, the U.S., it's a the economy is a house of bricks. No, it's not. It's a house of straw, people. Okay? And what keeps it from folding? What's it based all on? Confidence. It's all based on confidence. If, if we lose confidence, everything falls apart. Okay? So it's important to have confidence. All right. So sometimes customers are out there. And in some cases, it, man, it's really needed to have these regulations. Absolutely. Again, human nature. All right, so I will tell you this, and I've seen this firsthand at the state level and at the federal level, that the firms that are regulated argue like crazy with the regulators. And banking is way up there, and banks contribute tons of money to the politicians, okay? Tons of money to try to influence uh, regulation. And it's interesting because um, who knows an industry the best? People who are in the industry, okay? And so you've got, if you're, a, if you're in Congress and you're making regulations, rules and regulations, who are you going to talk to about regulating the industry? Well, you better talk to people in the industry because they, they know it better. But I'm telling you what they're going to do when you talk to them is they're going to resist, resist, resist. Okay, so it's a struggle. It's not easy to regulate. All right. Financial services, every firm out there tries to find ways around the rules. Okay. And, you know, that's, again, a little bit of a re repeat. How many times do we have to say it? Regulations uh, raise costs and reduce innovation and efficiency. All right. And they use that argument a lot. So back in the mid-'80s, when they started to dismantle some of the major banking regulations that were put in place after um, the... the, uh, the stock market crash of 29, the, their whole argument was, well, we can't compete with Japan. Back at y'all wouldn't know this, you know, who are, who's our biggest um, threat today for competition? Well, it's China, okay? And China feels that about the U.S., you know, it's just a natural thing. They're a big co country, we're a big country. Well, back in, in the 80s, it, China was nowhere to be seen because it was still communist and, and they, were, they were living in caves. Frankly, it was very primitive back then. Now, you go, they have the be most beautiful cities on the planet. If you see the pictures of their major cities, it, it's just breathtaking to see what's happening. But what we were worried about when, when I was your age was Japan. Oh, Japan, they were, Japan was buying U.S. real estate. They bought Rockefeller Center where the big Christmas tree is. We were scared to death. We thought Japan was going to take over the world, right? And so the banks were saying, well, the Japanese banks can do this and this and this, and these old regulations from, from 60 years ago are keeping us from, from doing things. And they talked the politicians into dismantling the regulations and ultimately 
that contributed to what happened in 2008 and 2009. It was a slow process, but we got there. And you'll see some of the rules and regulations in just a minute. All right, so who controls uh, banks? Who regulates banks? Well, the controller of the currency, and they, they uh, regulate national banks, banks that go to the federal government to get a charter because they want to do interstate banking. Okay? 1,450 banks, roughly, regulated by the controller of the currency. Okay? That's a big The OCC, the Office of the Controller of the Currency. All right, then the Federal Reserve. One of the things they do is they regulate banks, and they regulate state chartered banks. And they also regulate very large bank holding companies, and there are about 840 banks that the Federal Reserve regulates. Okay. And again, there's some crossover where you've got, you're regulated by two or three of these bodies. All right, here's another one. The FDIC, 4,500 banks. All uh, banks that want uh, to have their deposits insured are regulated by the FDIC. Remember, the FDIC uh, insures about 95% of all insured deposits. There are three or four other companies, they don't matter. Okay. All right, and then state banking commissions. And two years ago, I had uh, uh, the assistant uh, banking commissioner in Arkansas. She's now the banking commissioner. She's been promoted. She's now the banking commissioner in Arkansas. Come in and talk to us, okay? So uh, about 5,300 banks are state chartered and about 1,500 banks are national chart, okay? And so these, when you start talking regulation of banks, every time you look at a bank, you have to know that they're dealing with one or more of these bodies, and usually at least two, <coughs> at least two. You know, either the state, either the state board and the FDIC, or the comptroller and the currency in the FDIC. So when you start talking about rules that need to be changed, uh, like what happened uh, in the banking crisis, in the financial crisis back in 2009-2010, the key players were um, the directors of these organizations, okay, along with the treasury director, Hank Paulson. All right, then if you run a brokerage firm, okay, where you're buying and selling securities for people, you are also regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. We learn about the SEC and the investments class, okay. Securities Act 1939. All right. Then if you're involved in, in commodities, trading energy and chemicals and gold and, um, and agriculture, then uh, the Commodities Future Trading uh, Commission gets involved too. That's not so big, uh, but a lot, a lot of the banks, a lot of the money center banks do offer these commodities trading operations. All right. And then the Department of Justice is involved when banks want to merge, okay? Particularly if a merger is a, will significantly impact competition in an area, then the Department of Justice is going to jump in and look at it and say, no, this is going to really limit competition. We're not going to allow it, okay? And so this is, the DOJ is really big here. All right. Okay, so now let's start looking at some of the laws. Some of the laws. All right, so the National Currency and Bank Act, Bank Acts of 1863-1864, back in Civil War times. Okay, that's a long time ago. All right, first major major federal government laws. Okay, okay. so this is when bank legislation really started hitting. Okay. And they, want, they were getting organized. Insurance actually uh, got regulated even earlier, okay? But I'm sure banking had, was regulated in England and in Europe for a couple hundred years before they started regulating it in the U.S. So <clears throat> you, want to, you want to open up a bank, you had to get a charter, okay? And so they created uh, a department inside the U.S. Treasury Department called the OCC. And you had to apply to the OCC to open up a bank. Okay? So the OCC is the oldest regulator. 
So what are some of the things they do? Well, do we need another bank? You kind of have to ask yourself that question in Cersei. Do we need another bank? How many banks do we need in Cersei? They're all over the place, man. Okay. All right. And once the bank is open, they come in and make sure that the bank is financially sound and the bank is following sound business practices. Okay. So they're looking at the financial statements. Is this bank profitable? Do they have enough reserves, enough capital? And they look at the business practices. Are they treating people fairly? Okay. And that could be tough too. All right, then 40 years later, the next big law, the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Okay. And this happened after a financial crisis. Okay. So as I said in, in our first class or two, um, you have this cycle that happens, and so you have a crisis. What happens is you have practices that are destructive. And that leads to a crisis, which then leads to laws and regulation, which then lead, in part, to the next crisis, which then leads to changes in laws and regulations. So around and around we go. Right. Federal Reserve Act of 1913. So there was a series of, of financial panics. Okay. And so they said, you know what? We need to have a national central bank that is not controlled by the politicians. Really important to try to minimize the politics. You know who's bad about it? About trying to mix politics and the Fed Reserve? Donald Trump. Oh, he screamed all the time that the Federal Reserve didn't, uh, didn't lower interest rates aggressively enough. You know? And he knew that he, he really didn't have um, any impact on them. That was just pure politics. All right, so their most important job is to control money and credit, okay, in order to promote stability, low inflation, and full employment. So those are the things um, in their charter, the Federal Reserve has two uh, goals. One is low inflation, and then the other is full employment. And sometimes those two things aren't consistent. Okay? And sometimes they, they emphasize full employment over inflation, and sometimes it's the other way around. Like for the last 20 years or so, the Fed has been trying to get inflation up a little bit. It's been too low. Okay? We can run into deflation if we're not careful. So what kind of inflation are we looking for? Two to three percent. That seems to be a healthy level that everybody can deal with. Okay. Full employment. What's full employment? Somewhere around four to five percent. That's full employment. If employment gets drops below four percent, we're going to have inflation. All right. The Fed's other roles are to serve as the lender of last resort. What does that mean? If banks run out of credit they can go to the Federal Reserve. And that's what happened 